Hi, my name is Rachel. Welcome back to my channel. Rachel stands for the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. And today, this is my book review for Legendborn by Tracy Dion. Legendborn was published in September 2020, and I would call it a booktube darling. Booktube is how I found out about this book, and I am so grateful that I did. Because this book has been out for a while and because it's been so popular, I'm going to structure my video in two parts. The first part is going to be non-spoilers, and then the second part is going to be spoilers because I really want to talk about this book. I really enjoyed it. So Legendborn follows Brie. A few months after her mother has died, she's still in the grieving process, and she starts early college at UNC, University of North Carolina, and she's still going through the grief and trauma of losing her mother, but also the guilt because she thinks that her acceptance to the school since she applied behind her mother's back is part of the reason why her mom died. She remembers having sour words with her mother, and she feels guilty that that was the last thing that was said. Bree is starting this early college program with her best friend Alice, and the book starts off with Bree and Alice going to a party at the quarry, breaking the rules on the first night there. They're caught, but the dean decides not to toss them out because, hey, this is what people are going to do. They understand that. Instead, they're going to be given a mentor to help them navigate this early college experience. And Bree's mentor is Nick. Through Nick, she ends up meeting the Order of the Round Table, which is, yes, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Same time as she is going through her grief and trauma, memories of her mother's death start coming to the surface and she realizes that what she has been thinking the past four months might not be what actually happened when her mother died. She ends up thinking that the, this order of the round table might have had something to do with her mother's death and she uses Nick to find out more. So my favorite thing about this book are the characters. They are all fully fleshed out, even the side characters. I guess I should say my favorite character in the book, besides Brie, because I really enjoy her, is Sarah. I really like her. Her spunky attitude and her willingness to do things. I really enjoyed being in Brie's head. And honestly, sometimes I forgot that she was only 16 because she seemed more mature than her age. I would remember that she was in college and so I would automatically age her up to 18. And then she would do something I'd be, and I'd remember, oh yeah, she's only 16. She does not have this figured out. And that's something I really liked is Dion allowed the character to drive the story. Yes, there was a plot that where things needed to happen. The steps to get to there happened because of the characters and the characters were in the driver's seat. They were the ones pushing the action, pushing everything forward. And that is so refreshing to have in any book. A big downside for this book for me is how quick it is. And I don't mean like in like terms of how fast it is to read. This book is set over two to three weeks. And I think that some of the characterization for items were lost in that because of such the quick pace. It made it harder for me to believe that certain things would happen. An example of this would be Bree's relationship with her love interest. I like that we did not get insta-love. That was great. But the relationship still happened really fast after that. It was a couple days later. Man, they're interested in each other. And by the end of the book, characters are saying, oh, he loves you. Maybe it's just my personality, but I can't believe in love in a couple of weeks. I don't think people fall in love that fast. I can believe that they're very interested in one another and want to get to know each other more, but to be completely head over heels in love in two weeks, mm -mm, I, I'm not buying it. So that was a detractor for me. However, I loved how the relationship was written. It was a very respectful relationship. It was cute, you know, gives you all the nice feels, and neither one was pushing the other one to do anything that they would be uncomfortable with. Consent was a big part of this relationship, which was beautiful to see. So the relationship as it was written, I really enjoyed. I just think it would have made more sense if it had been, oh, 
say, done over a semester versus two weeks. But again, that's a personal preference for me because that's not how falling in love has ever worked for me. Also, to get the plots and events moving, I think it would have been fine to have it stretched out through the semester. One of the things that Brie needed to do was a trial where she was fighting. She has no experience fighting. Having the story stretch through the semester would have made more sense, especially I think would have helped hers and Nick's relationship if Nick was like, you need to learn these skills. This is a trial that's going to be happening. And then we get to see more groundwork. In the book, she had three days to learn fighting, and then it was the fighting trial. I do like how they made the effort to say, oh, yeah, you're going to lose. But it's how you lose that is important. Because you can lose with honor, or you can lose, or you can be a bad loser, as another side character did. And so because of the lack of practice, what did happen in the trials was a little far-fetched for me to believe. Again, I stand by my statement. I think if the time length of the story had been over months versus weeks or days, that more relationship and training would have made more sense. I love the relationship that Brie had with her best friend, Alice, especially when you have somebody who knows that you're hurting, knows that you're in pain, and is still trying to, like, they're trying to reach out to you. They're trying to help you. And so to me, it made sense that Alice would reach out to Bree's dad when she thinks that Bree's not doing well. I like that Bree had a good relationship with her dad, even as she talks about their grieving differently for her mother. She's still able to talk with her dad. I think that's very important to see is healthy relationships. I mean, not every relationship in this book is healthy, but you get to have the balance of healthy versus not healthy. So this book packs a lot of themes into it. We have the theme of losing a loved one. So we have grief and trauma and the process of working through it versus not working through it. We have the theme of racism. I believe this book is written in a way to have white people understand a black woman's experience. Brie is not a monolith. She does not represent every woman out there, but she does represent some. In the notes at the end of the book, the author does say that Brie has a lot in common with with herself. So we can say that Brie is, she represents someone who is working and studying in a white dominated area. Through this racism lens, especially through Bree's lens, we get to see the effects of intergenerational trauma, especially surrounding slavery. We get to see microaggressions. I mean, she even threw in like hair culture. So there are a lot of black female experiences that are in this book that white people just don't understand or don't know about. So if you know anybody who wants to ask questions, you might just give them this book so then they can get an eye-opener first. I think Tracy Dan did a very good job with having a very diverse cast. I know I've heard the complaint that not enough Black students were in this book or Black people were in the book, but she didn't skimp on that either. And it is said at the beginning that this university has a prior a predominantly white population. Brie meets Mariah, who asks her point blank, have you joined the black student movement? Come join us. We're here for you. Besides that, we also have Alice, who is an Asian American. We have Sarah, who is a Peruvian American. And then other representations we have is Greer, who they don't explicitly state if they're non-binary, genderqueer, or what like what their orientation is, and that's okay. But we get to see Brie use their pronoun, what they're comfortable with. And we see other different types of sexual orientations all over this book. So I would call this a very diverse cast. Another theme was the magic, the different magic systems. I enjoyed Dan's description at the back of Rootcraft and how the Rootcraft that is in this book is not what is practiced in real life. 
it is something that is specific to this book. But having that idea of ancestors and honoring them and working with them versus what the order does with their aether where they are taking it and their aether comes through other O's and magic that has been done to their family lines. Having that magical balance was really interesting. And I hope to learn more about that in the next book. And I think another theme was the Arthurian legend. There's so many different stories out there that are romanticized and happy. So it was interesting to have a take where you have people who are believing these romanticized versions and yet the truth of what they're learning is oh this it was actually something else so i think that turns into the theme is don't set your heart so much on what is already out there about a myth or a legend because there's room and invention that can happen with it so i believe this ends my non-spoiler section please if you have any comments leave them down below. I'd like to talk more about more about this book with you, but now I'm going to go into the spoiler section. Hi, welcome to the spoiler section. So Legendborn, as we are talking about. So the spoiler section might be a little more chaotic because I don't have a fully formed plan. I just want to talk about the elements of the book. And while I really enjoy the romantic relationship between Nick and Brie, and I talked about it in the non-spoiler section that it was too fast for me, but the relationship as a whole, I do enjoy. I also like her relationship with Selwyn. And there's an interesting framing device that Tracy Dion did. All right. And there's an interesting framing device that Dion did, whereas we start the book with Brie meeting Selwyn at the quarry as she's thinking about jumping. And we end the book with Selwyn taking her to the quarry and she actually jumps. Now, as an avid reader, most of the time I go, oh, she met a guy, that's the guy she's gonna fall in love with. And then we get Nick instead. And like I said, I really like Nick. And this book does not do a traditional love triangle. For the majority of this book, Selwyn is trying to prove that Brie is a shadowborn and he's convinced that she's a bad problem, bad issue, and he's trying to take her out. And when it becomes clear through their interactions with the hell foxes in the graveyard, then he's like, oh, okay, you're, you're not actually shadowborn. I believe you now. And I think at that point, he became intrigued by her. Because he got to see her mage flame first. I don't even remember if she's told Nick. Or if she had the opportunity to actually tell Nick about it. Before the end of the book. But I think that was the turning point in her relationship with Selwyn. And he became very interested with her. And again, since the book is only over two or three weeks. I don't think we get her relation, her change of relationship with Selwyn fully fleshed out or formatted. Yeah. I don't think we get her relationship with Selwyn fully fleshed out to get the responses at the end of the book that we do. I believe that he's intrigued with her and he's interested in getting to know her better. And we get to see that even though he has been ordered to stay away from her, he keeps being drawn back. or He keeps, you know, finding a way to skirt that, oh, I'll help with the training. And in fact, it's him that we get to see where he helps her with her weapons training. Again, I don't believe, I don't buy it that she was able to win two of her trials after that one session with him. No. Still, I would have liked to see her and Nick start the whole, let's teach you how to fight. And then closer to someone starts going, well, yeah, don't do that. Do this instead and seeing her taking Selwyn's advice over Nick sometimes. I think that would start to show that a little bit of that conflict between them. But again, I don't think her relationship has progressed with Selwyn to the point that at the end, when he yells at her during the battle, don't you ever do that to me again, and then at the very end calls her beloved. Yes, I know what the Welsh word beloved is, so I recognized it when he called it to her. 
called her it. I'm having a hard time buying that that is their relationship or that's where they are at in their relationship. Again, too fast. It's way too fast for me to believe. But again, not me. It's not my personality. No, I was never someone who had a crush that fast. I would be interested in maybe a couple weeks, but love, no. But even as someone is getting more interested in Brie, I do like that he's like, oh, I know you and Nick are together. And especially when they're dancing at the gala and she sees that Nick's getting jealous and he's having fun with this. And she's like, is this your purpose? He goes, no, but I can enjoy it still the same. You get to see the conflict that's between him and Nick isn't actually Brie, but Brie is inflaming it, making it stand out more. I think Dion does a great job with setting the stage. It just makes sense to me that Brie is the scion of Arthur. Because when she meets with her therapist at the very beginning, she, her, her Patricia even says, oh, your dad says you were wise. And we know that is one of Arthur's traits. And so when it comes to like, oh, well, of course, she is the scion of Arthur because she is wise. I didn't expect that Nick would be the sign of Lancelot. That one was a surprise for me. I thought it would be where now they're competing because they're related with one another. But no, just completely removing him and he doesn't have the bloodline of Arthur. That is a nice plot twist there. Also the plot twist with Selwyn's mother being Bree's mother's friend and even you know, being with them the whole time, or staying in contact with her mother the whole time. I enjoyed finding out about that. I liked how having Brie join the group, it wasn't like she was all of a sudden like, how do you guys not know any of the stuff that I'm learning? But we could see that they're like, oh, we know this. And she's like, okay, well, I noticed this over here. And they're like, wait, what? It just shows that different people pay attention to different details. And I thought that was interesting. I think having this younger set of scions and then showing them against the older leashes, especially uh, Lord Mark, Lord Davis, especially against Lord Davis, Lord Davis has a very antiquated view of the world and how things should work. Like he believes the myths that were published about Arthur versus the realities that he should have known as a scion of Arthur at one time himself. I liked that we could see that the younger generation has different priorities. And we could see this through the science that needed to choose a squire, which squires they chose, sends, I think, a clear message that older generation, you need to leave. Your ideas are old and they don't serve us anymore. They don't serve at all. We see that each of the three squires that were chosen were a controversial sort of pick. Now, they were considered contra- controversial to the conservative mindset of the order itself. I mean, all the adults, when Witty gets chosen by William to be his, um, to be his squire, you, they even said you could kind of hear some rumbling, but mostly everyone's okay because Witty comes from a vassal family. It's not one of the well-known or well-liked vassal families. Whatever. He's still a vassal family. And then with Pete naming Greer as his squire, you get a little more grumbling because now we have somebody who does not fit their mold of who a squire should be just because of his gender identity. And then having Nick choose Bree as his squire, for what all the adults flip their lid. And even one woman's like, you stole this from my son. And it's like, well, your son never had a chance with Nick because he blew it himself. But these are the choices that the current science made, which means they don't walk lockstep with the regents or the other adults in their lives. They're not idiots. Yes, they've been trained for this, but that doesn't mean that they're going to follow 
conventional wisdom just because that's what the adults want. One of the things I liked in the story was the redemption arc for Vaughn. Vaughn is a jerk. He's racist. But again, because Dion writes her side characters so well, we actually get to see that Vaughn, it's not just, it's not that he is just racist. He also has actually been working really hard for this opportunity and he wants it wholeheartedly and he is a horrible loser when Brie beats him with the sword to the fact that he breaks her collarbone and Nick decide tells him that he will never choose him as his squire and that is what Vaughn has been wanting but yet like I said there's a redemption here you know after the gala when Lord Davis tells Vaughn, oh, stick around because he's actually planning for Vaughn to be Nick's squire because he's telling Nick that Bree changed her mind and doesn't want to be his squire anymore. You know, Vaughn sees the mage fire battle that's going on in campus and runs to the lodge to let them know. That tells you right there that his true purpose is maintain the safety of the Onceborns to kill Shadowborn. That is really what he is trained for. And that's what he believes to the point where he's not bonded with anybody. He has no hope of ever becoming Nick's squire, but yet he, along with Bree, join the other legendborn to go find Nick. We see him on a process of change as he even tells Bree, I know you prefer the staff, you're more comfortable with it, but take the sword because you're not going to have room to use the staff underground. Does this mean that he's not racist anymore? No, that is not what this means. But what it means is we can see him growing as a person. He he got an arc. That's how awesome Dion is at writing her characters. She gave the side character a freaking arc. And actually, I have a prediction that I think that if Bree is forced to choose a squire, she's going to ask Vaughn just because of his actions because while Bree might not think he's the best person in the world his actions matter to her she is an action-oriented person you did this you proved you care about Nick you proved you care about you know fighting the shadow born and I know you have trained the hell out for this so I could see her choosing Vaughn as a squire now is Nick gonna like this option? Oh, probably not. Is someone going to like it? No, I don't think, I think everyone's going to think that she's crazy, but I can still see her doing it or at least making the offer, even if Vaughn doesn't accept. So yeah, this book is 500 pages. And honestly, I would have been fine if it was longer because I really enjoyed this book. It wasn't perfect, but it hit all the right notes for me and became a five-star read. This is a book that I know that I will be rereading in the future, and I look forward to reading the sequel when it comes out. Fortunately, I don't think it comes out until next year. So if you haven't read Legendborn yet, you should go pick it up. If you have, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you didn't, that's okay. I still would love to talk about this book with you in the comments. Thank you and have a great day.